hey everybody welcome back to the noel castler podcast happy valentine's day i brought a sexy guitar for today's show Better stop. Better stop. Anyway, how you guys doing? Good to see you. Welcome back. Episode 94 of the Noel Castler podcast. Sorry for the uh, self-indulgent intro. You know, I got this drum machine here in the 90s and I it's been in a been in a closet for about 20 or 30 years. <laughs> and uh I broke it out and I'm addicted to it. So anyway, I put on my pink pants. It's Valentine's Day. I dressed up for you guys. Put on my nice mala, good watch, ready to get into it. Episode 94. Thanks for coming back. Sorry it's been a minute. I say that all the time now. You know, we're in such kind of depressing times that uh, I don't want to just come on here and rant for an hour. I mean, I know that's what I end up doing anyway, but I don't want to dump negativity on you guys as a listener, you know, so I only kind of come when I feel like I have something to say and add to the conversation or there's something that shouldn't slip by without discussing. And that's what I feel like this is kind of a discussion because I always read all your comments and I appreciate you guys listening. What a week, right? What a week already. You know, we had the Super Bowl the other day. I guess that's a good place to start. It's fun to watch the Super Bowl at home. I did it, I think, 12 years in a row. And uh, the last one I did was in Minneapolis. The first one I did was with Prince uh, in the aughts. We, my team that I work with has been doing it since the 90s. And uh, I used to skip it all the time. I didn't realize how much fun it was. And then I went and did the one with Prince. And I was like, this is amazing, <laughs> you know? And uh, I did it until it wasn't fun anymore. But it, it's fun to watch it at home. It's a new production team. It's Jay-Z. Um, it's a lot of the same people I work with, but it, uh, on my end of things, it's sort of a different producer. Not that I was the producer, but I worked for the producer. So they're doing a great job, you know, different generation, different kind of thing. I love the vibe. I've worked with Rihanna a gazillion times, you know, since the first time she showed up on MTV New Year's Eve. And I said, who is this? And they said, oh, it's the next big thing. This is Rihanna. And she is, <laughs> she she lived up to the hype and she's having an amazing career and it was a cool moment. And if you didn't enjoy it, screw you. <laughs> That's the way I feel about it. Not everything is for you, you know? That doesn't mean you can't enjoy it. You know, people that were complaining about it being too woke, we know what that's all about, you know? She was fierce. It's a spectacle. It's a show. Everybody lip syncs. You're never hearing anything live, no matter who the artist is. So don't get caught up in that i don't mean all times but i mean you know the super bowl itself there's no time to do line checks <laughs> there's five minutes to build the stage and then you got you know the six seven minutes of a performance and and, and you want a spectacle and that's what they delivered and it was entertaining i wish the game was more entertaining for such a great game i i had an emotional hangover at the end you know it wasn't like a thrilling satisfying thing to watch in my opinion it was kind of brutal like the whole playoffs were you know I, I had an emotional hangover from every football game I watched this year too bad Jimmy's not the co-host anymore because you know I know he was rooting for uh 
Kansas City, and he loves uh, Mahanis, Mahonis, <laughs> Mahomes. You can tell how how big a jock I am. <laughs> I can't even say it. But anyway, welcome back. All right, I I, I got to show you these pink pants again for the folks watching at home. These are pretty dope, huh? These are my Christmas pants, and uh, I'm wearing them for Valentine's Day for obvious reasons. But uh, I'm trying to be in a good mood. You know, it's about love and, and love is, is what we need in this world. Valentine's Day is about romantic love, which is different than love, love, right? It's that's sort of an attachment. You know, we, we, we often all the love songs and all that stuff, which is cool. And there's a place for it. But what they're really talking about is attachment, you know, like picking out a specific person and deciding that that person is going to make you happy. Real love and relationships require a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice, but that excitement, that Cupid's arrow kind of thing, that refers to, you know, the excitement of attachment. You know, when I get this person, I'm going to be happy. And then, of course, when you get the person half the time, you're worried about losing them, right? So you're never happy because you always are trying to do the right thing so you don't blow it, you know, and, and you stop being yourself, right? You don't... If they want to go to the movies and you don't, you feel like you have to go to please them. I'm not talking about compromise, you know, in a mature relationship. I'm talking about those early, you know, trying to be who you think that person wants you to be. It never works, right? But it's an exciting ride. And, you know, sometimes you have good sex <laughs> before you get your heart broken. So wherever you're at in your romantic journey, I, I wish you the best. And if you're alone... That's not always a bad place to be either, okay? You know, everything you need is already inside you. Nobody can come give you something that you don't already have when it comes to happiness, right? And that's what I'm speaking about in terms of that kind of romantic love. You know, it's a, it's a great ideal and it's a great thing to sort of participate in and it's a great thing to sell chocolates and, and, and love songs about, but it's not really love. If it, it, if you feel like you don't have love in, in your life, you're talking about you don't have relationships in your life, you know, like you have love, you were made out of love. That's what we are. And the whole universe is love. And any moment that comes before you is an opportunity to either love, you know, move closer to love or pull away from love. And a lot of the problems we have in the world now are, are simply coming from a lack of, of losing our sense of what love really means, you know. Power is not love, right? D domination is not love. Coercion is not love. Exploitation is not love. Love doesn't need any of those things. Love doesn't need you to show up for me to exist. You know, love, real love is like you and I come together and happiness happens. It, it's not related to you or I. It just sort of happens. And if you go away in your different direction, I should be happy for you and happy for the time we spent together. You know, that's true love. That That's a hard ideal to achieve, you know, in, in most of us, you know, for most of us in our lifetimes. But that's kind of what that idea of romantic love as opposed to real love gets into. This might be a little too esoteric, but uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Anthony DeMello. He was a Jesuit priest and he wrote a book called The Way to Love, which is about all these things. It's about loving without attachment, you know, and, and the spiritual concept of what love is. And if you've seen my live shows, you know, I do that whole story about Stevie Wonder and, and my time working with Stevie Wonder and how he called me out on that, you know, because when we did the inauguration the first time in 2008, I went up to Stevie, we were in this greet, you know, we we're in this sort of meet and greet with, with then president elect Obama. This is a couple of days before the inauguration. And I said, Stevie, like, you know, it's great to meet you. I'd bumped into him on accident and I apologized. And I leaned into his ear and said, Hey, Stevie, by the way, it's Noel. I didn't mean to jostle you. You know, we've worked together before. I just wanted you to know, you know, I'm sorry. And I was friendly and all that. And he goes, yeah, but something's different about you now. And he pulled me in close to him and he's got these big long arms and he pulls me in close and he's kind of like hugging me. And I go, well, you know, that's because I know what you're talking about now. And he goes, what am I talking about? And I said, you're singing about love and how if we react to the world with only love in our hearts, with no fear 
then we can really change this place. Then we can really understand love and love in action and who we're meant to be as human beings. And he goes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, that's the only thing I've ever been singing about. <laughs> and I, I, I know I've told that story recently on the podcast, but, you know, that summed it up for me with Stevie because he, he he didn't, he didn't, you know, he, he knows this stuff, you know, fundamentally. And that's what he's singing about. And he's a master romantic guy, right? Nobody's got more songs that are, that are good to get in the love and mood than Stevie Wonder, in my opinion, you know, but uh, especially like my Sharia more, you know, pretty as a summer day, he's always relating it to nature, right? He's relating his idea and his experience of love and our experience of love with what's all around us, with the obvious signs of love in the universe, right? Love is there. Love is in a flower, is in a beam of sunshine, is in a blue sky. It's in a gray sky too, you know? <laughs> It's how we interpret these things and, and how we react to them. And if we're always reacting to things with a place of love, from a place of love, we sort of always have the answer for what's next, right? And you can you can bring presence into that too, right? Because presence is really just love, right? If you're completely aware, you're, you're going to be without the fear and the ego and the things that get in our way of, of truly experiencing love and more importantly, serving and loving others. Because that's what it comes down to. You know, when you really love something or someone, you want the best for them. You don't need what's best for you. You want that person to live out their dreams and watch their dreams come true or that being, you know, or that tree or that flower to find the sunlight you know, that's what real love is. It's like we're gardeners, you know, we're here to cultivate this magical planet that we've been blessed with in a lifetime, which is the blink of an eye when it comes down to it. You know, when you look at the big picture, we're only here for a little bit of time. And the most important thing we can do is love each other. That's the only thing that never leaves right? Love never leaves. Love doesn't end. The love we feel lives on beyond us. It lives in, in the lives you know, left behind and it lives, lives, lives in what's to come, right? It, it, love never dies. It just changes shape and it changes form, but it's always there around us. And if you tune into things, you can feel that. If you're really present, you can feel the presence of the loved ones you've lost, right? I, I know everybody has probably had an experience like that. You know, when I lost my cat, who was my best friend, it was one of the hardest days of my life. And, and and my cat had been with me for 18 years and I knew it was coming and stuff. And this whole place is for the cat, you know? <laughs> like, so his last years would be outside of the city and, you know, I would take him for walks on a little leash out by the pond and all this kind of stuff. And when he passed away, it was on a Sunday and he, he died in bed and uh, took his last breath. And, and I ha had this voice come into my head like as soon as he passed it was like you can't just zone out and watch tv now like i'm not here to watch over you i'm not here to keep you company you got to be sober you got to be alert and aware now because because my cat was always a symbol of awareness to me and love right because he was always looking at me sort of non-judgmentally but knowing you know I was on a TV show called Why People Love Cats and Dogs with my cat. You can look it up. It's a PBS thing. And I talk about at rock bottom when I was an alcoholic and I was isolated out in the Hamptons and I was drinking all day. I'd come out of the bathroom. I'd lock myself in the bathroom, essentially, and smoke cigarettes, you know, because I wasn't supposed to smoke in the house or whatever, you know, and I'd be drinking and I'd come out and my cat would look at me like, dude, what is wrong with you? You know, and it was something about the love and awareness in his eyes that got through to me when I even felt beyond human help, right? So this cat was a little furry soldier, <laughs> you know, in my story who helped me wage my own battles with life and with my own spirit. So when he left, he's like, look, you're going to be okay, you know, but but you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to make good on the lessons that we, we, we've we learned together. And so he, he passed away on a Sunday and you know, I had him, you know, there in a, in a guest bedroom kind of until I could bury him the following in a couple in a day, you know, and uh, I had a gig the next day. I was doing the Global Citizens 
uh, festival, which is something in New York City. And I had to be at rehearsal. We were rehearsing down by NYU or something. And Brit Brandy Carlisle was on that gig and George Harrison's son, amongst others. And, uh, you know, I was distraught. And, and and all my co, you know, the stage managers, you know, we're like a family. So everyone knew my my cat had passed away before I got to the gig, and they were surprised that I even came to work. And I was like, I have to be at work. Like I, I don't want to be alone with that, you know, pain. And I have this uh, bandana that I always this, this black bandana. I still have it. I, I use it. it. It's like a totem. I always have it with me for good luck. Anytime you've seen me perform, it's there either in my dressing room or my pocket or something. And it represents, you know, I think of it as as representing my cat. So I brought it to work with me and I tied it around my wrist and I was outside and I was really missing the cat. I think I was like smoking a cigarette or something that I shouldn't have been doing. And uh, I looked down at my wrist. I was thinking about the cat and I had this voice in my head and it said, you know, if you're aware of your breath, I'm always with you. You know, if you need to sort of make contact with me, just make contact with your own breath, you know, breathing in and out and I'm there. That thought came into my head and I looked down and I had this bandana tied around my wrist and there was like an errant little thread and that thread was shaped like a heart in that moment, you know, it was shaped like a heart. And in that moment, that was my cat. You know, saying, I'm here. I didn't go anywhere. If you want to see me, be present and I'll be there. You know, if you want to feel me, be present and I'll be there. And that's what love is. Love is presence. Everyone we've loved and lost, they're with us in a way, you know? It, it, it never leaves. You just have to sort of go deeper to find it and uh, or become more aware. Deeper isn't even the right analogy because it implies that this is hard to find. It's not hard to find. It's right there. We look beyond it most of the time in life, right? We go beyond love. We go beyond the obvious. You know, we think life is something to be conquered all the time and, and something to accumulate more and then we'll finally be happy. That's a trick. It doesn't work. It's like fame, you know, fame is a fool's game. <laughs> it doesn't fix your problems. It's nice to be appreciated and it's nice to have an opportunity to work and all that. And you need to be famous to like make it in certain careers, but to, and I'm not knocking famous people. That's not my point. I made my living supporting famous people. But like, my point is like, you think as a young man or woman you know when you go into the arts like if i achieve this i'll finally be happy and that's the biggest like illusion that most people fall for and a lot of people don't survive the other side of that because they they become famous and they still have all the crap that they were hoping it would fix and 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 now it's like what next and they also have all these other pressures and indulgencies and money and it can be a, a death spiral and i've seen it happen to friends of mine you know it's happened too many times and that's an example of that you know you, you think a, a lot of wealth will fix you look at all these billionaires that are miserable you know speaking of the super bowl you had elon musk and and murdoch sitting in a skybox right two of the most evil men in the world, basically, you know, I mean, when it comes down to it, those two guys are probably responsible for more disinformation and more suffering, you know, in this current moment than a lot of people you can point to. They certainly don't look like happy men. They're certainly not doing good in the world with their money. They're trying to accumulate more and accumulate power and help others that are bent on dominating the world you know, with an authoritarian sort of like bent so they can continue their way of life, which is just greed, unfettered greed, fear, right? The opposite of love, the opposite of love. You know, love doesn't ask for anything. Love wants to give you something, you know? A friend of mine went to work with Mother Teresa, well-known woman in New York City. Her name was Lorna. She was in the Sex and the City movies. She was an auctioner auctioneer and uh at at uh Sotheby's or something real fit you know famous in that world art dealer had like a pink streak in her hair very cool iconic woman she passed away a few years ago but very wise woman and I 
I sort of studied with her in a way as many of us did in a certain uh, fraternity in New York City and uh, fellowship rather. And uh, when she was on this sort of spiritual path, she, she made a pilgrimage to Calcutta to work with Mother Teresa. And essentially she got there and met Mother Teresa and Mother Teresa was like, what do you want from me? I can't help you. You've already found a way to help people back home. <laughs> Go do that. You know, go help the people you've already found in your life that need your help. You know, that's love in action. That's wisdom. You know, it's like the Buddha said, I'm saying, you know, a lot. I apologize. People get mad when I do that. The Buddha after enlightenment was like before, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. That's all there is. Waking up every day being present, being in the moment, you know, that's love. Self, it's self-love is the most important kind of love. You know, it, it's very rare that you find somebody who truly loves themselves. And I don't mean in an egotistical fashion, everybody has their foibles and their faults and, you know, the things they wish they could change about their image or their body or something, but being, being kind to yourself, being loving, being caring, appreciating you know, lying down in a comfy bed at night and having a roof over your head and having enough food to eat. What more do you want? You know, because if you can't appreciate those things, you don't have anything. You can be in a palace and you're only going to want more. It's not going to work. But if, if you have gratitude, if you have love for who you are as a person and, and what you've been given in this life and that you're alive and can help somebody else, you have the whole universe, right? You're the richest man you could be or woman, right? Because you can't take any of that stuff with you. You can't take any of that stuff with you. And it's all of inside of you. It's all already there in your heart, but it gets covered up and layered and, and wounded. And that's natural too. That's what life does to you. We get programmed by our parents and our society you know, we come at it from a way of, of, of we don't have enough, especially in our society, right? Because we live in a capitalistic, you know, consumerist society where it's all about having more. How many cars does somebody need? How many boats does somebody need? Most people don't even get boats and you're lucky to have a car. When you have enough, you realize you're taken care of and you realize something bigger than you is looking out for you like God is providing or whatever God is to you. It's not, and I'm not talking Jesus, he gets us <laughs> those commercials. I'm saying whatever that force is that's providing for you in the universe, if you can connect to it in a way that you feel like no matter what you'll be taken care of, I, I can't think of a, a, a bigger blessing to have in life. And that's something I've struggled with my whole life because I've always instinctually known it was going to work out. And yet I've always lived in a lot of fear that it wasn't gonna. And, and a lot of that comes from childhood stuff and uncertainty and moving around a lot. And, you know, just a lot of trauma I experienced as a kid that hard wires you. I'm 52 almost next month. I'm 52 and I'm, I look good. Don't I? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, the, the podcast listening people don't know what the hell I look like, but, um, I'm joking, but you know, I'm 52 and childhood sadness, childhood trauma impacts every aspect of my life, even more so now, cause I'm in a position where I can uh, kind of sit around in, in the suburbs, you know, uh, where I am up in the sort of horse country on the border of Connecticut. So there's a lot of peace and quiet and there's a lot of time to be alone. And, and when I get out of the day to day, frenetic pace of life and the city, I settle into myself and I see what's still there, what hasn't been excavated from my psyche and, and what can still get triggered. And, and that's not all bad because I can be creative and trying to deal with it. And, and, and that's why I've always played music. For me, music is just to placate my soul. I don't, you know, I've written some songs and stuff, but I've never pursued a career as a musician. I play the music to sort of calm my own self and to, to use it as a barometer of where I'm at and, and a way to offset the, the sadness 
and, and steam that builds up in life, just like you would exercise. You know, it's a form of meditation for me. And that's why I have instruments within arm's reach. You guys can't see, but the whole rest of the house is like <laughs> racks of instruments, any kind of instrument, you know, that I can just reach for and, and play a little melody that might soothe me. And that that's me trying to soothe my inner child. And there's nothing wrong with that. That might sound hippy dippy to some of you, but you know, that's the way it works out for me. It's like, uh, you know, a lot of people do therapy and I've done a lot of therapy, you know, CBT, you know, cog cognitive behavioral training is trying to find out what those wounds are from your childhood and, and, and acknowledging it, you know, and nurturing it and, and letting the adult you know that things are all right. You don't have to feel that way. And that stuff doesn't generally come like nobody hits you over the, you know, hits you with a magic wand and you just wake up that way. <laughs> you got to do some work to get to that point. Just like if you're getting sober, it's about the work, right? Faith without works is dead. That's what the Buddha meant when he's, you know, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, you know? So you have some insight and some wisdom. You're still in human form. You're still bound by this body, you know, that, that's running against a ticking, you know, clock and your time's going to run out. The, the question of what you do with it is how much work you do on yourself that allows you to serve others. Right. Because you, you can't just ignore your own pain and dedicate your life to helping others. Like, you know, you, you can be there's a thing like the wounded healer. You know, you can do it while in process and that will help you heal. Nothing will give you more insights into yourself than than helping someone else. That's the principle of AA. Right. One alcoholic helping another because we've been there. So we know what you're going through. And the miracle of that is that you feel better sitting down, listening to where somebody else is at, you know, even for no other reason than you're like, thank God I'm not there anymore. <laughs> it's like, I thought my day was bad. You know, this guy's on day one and he feels like hell, you know, but you see it clearly. You can see in others what you can't see in yourself. That's why art is so important as I talk about every week, right? That's why art creates empathy. That's why we go to plays to understand ourselves. It's why we listen to, you know, comedians or musicians or, you know, why we go watch jazz and listen to people listening to each other, playing the same melody, but coming at it from a different point of view, from a different harmonic structure and seeing how those harmonies interact with each other. That's a conversation. It's a dialogue. And a dialogue is what leads to understanding and what leads to wisdom and what elevates all of us. You know, I saw a clip of uh, Wynton Marsalis this week, and uh, you've heard me talk about Wynton before. One, one of the great, you know, just a national treasure and an incredible educator. So as his father was, the whole family is a massive influence on me. And uh, he was doing a Q&A with students. He does, you know, he's at link jazz at lincoln center it's a big educational organization too we did a big benefit uh to help them raise money when i was working with csn but i he so he was given one of these talks to students and, and a student got up and asked him what he thought was going to be like this gotcha question about jazz you know and he says is is jazz for the listener or is it is it for the player you know and went and goes hold up all music is for the listener, you know? All music is for the listener, but the first listener is the player. That's deep, right? All music is made for the listener, but the first listener is the player. That's like a spiritual axiom, right? You could apply that to any kind of healing, any kind of modality where you're trying to help somebody else. Your first job is to be in tune with yourself. Doesn't mean you have to be perfected. Doesn't mean you have to be a master at it, but you have to listen. Listen to your own inner voice before you tell people, you know, what you think they need to do, <laughs> you know? And often that inner voice will tell you to be silent. You know, silence is, is as much a, a benefit to others as talking to them. Listening to somebody is a great gift, 
You know, if you got a, a romantic partner at home, listen to them tonight over your dinner. You know, give them your presence, give them your full attention, not looking at your phone or whatever. You know, be there. You know, bear witness to another soul, connect with their eyes. That's why people like these podcasts, I guess, right? Because you sort of listen in on others and they speak candidly, you know, and they talk about their lives and we relate to that. We get sick of the polished, flashy stuff. I went to see Mark Marin on Friday night. He was given a speech at the 92nd Street Y, which is a big cultural institution on the Upper East Side that's had a massive influence on me. I, I love going to talks there. It's, it's my neighborhood in the city. And uh, I did stuff there when I worked with Jackson Brown and a bunch of, you know, it's just a great organization. So Mark Marin, you know, who, who's the king of podcasts and all that stand-up comedian uh, was doing a talk there. So we went and uh, listened and, you know, he talked about how his fans relate to him, you know, how people listen to him and, and, and feel like they know him, but they don't really know him, <laughs> you know, just like you don't really know anybody, but you know part of them and you have an intimacy there and that creates a bond. And I think, you know, he was probably one of the first guys to really reveal himself on uh, on his podcast. And I've never listened to his podcast, full disclosure. I watched his show. I love it. I've seen his stand up act, but uh, I've never actually listened to his podcast, though. I'm sure I like it. And I'm sure whatever this podcast it is, is has a huge debt to Mark Marin because that's all I try to do is, is hit record and, you know, speak to you about where I'm at and the things I think are, are worthy of, of you know, remarking upon. I don't have guests, as you, as you well know, but I think he probably was an early, you know, like, uh, you know, he was on the vanguard of that, just like, I'm going to like, just be unfiltered and tell you the real deal. And that's attractive. That's the same thing you see in AA meetings. And obviously Mark's in, in sobriety as well. But uh, he, he started opening up, you know, at the end of the thing, the, the interviewer was asking, he, he lost his girlfriend during the pandemic, Lynn Shelton, who's a director. And, you know, it's obviously an, an open wound. And I saw him last year at a theater in Connecticut. And he was sort of working out some of this material that's in his new special on HBO, dealing with loss in a, in a most horrific, shocking way, you know, in a matter of, days she got sick and, and and passed away and you know he was there for it all and he started revealing you know what it felt like to sit down and do an episode the monday after he lost his girlfriend and, and he showed up to do it anyway because he felt he owed that to the audience you know that that's what he had always prided himself on was showing up and speaking and being honest and i found that very inspiring and, and so, you know, inspiring and, and something to aspire to, because I don't know that I always do that. I, I'm always unfiltered, but I'm not always here, right? I, I used to be <laughs> every Tuesday and then I, or Monday when it came out. And uh, now I'm like, I, I, I only do it when I feel like I can. And part of that is self-care and the grinding down of the last few years. And part of that is like, I don't have a producer or anything. It's just me doing it. <laughs> Mark was making money at it. So uh, that's an extra <laughs> uh, incentive, but certainly not what was motivating him or what the point was of this conversation. And when he continued to talk about Lynn and the screenplay they were working on together and how it had brought them close, you could see the moment when he, you know, he realized she wasn't there. I mean, he knows it instinctually, but anyone who's lost somebody, there's those moments where, where the reality of them being gone hits you like a knife, you know, and it could be years after you've lost them. And it's still, when it's fresh, it, it has that way of just catching you and it caught him and, it, and you know, and he teared up and, and, and cried, you know, he was, became very emotional for a minute, you know, uh, in front of an audience, you know, in front of a couple hundred people in a theater. And I love that, you know, to me, that's a real man, <laughs> you know, don't be ashamed of that stuff. You know, that's what we need in the world. We need empathy. We need people that can, you know, express their pain publicly. Doesn't mean everybody needs to walk around and cry, but it means we don't have to hide from our pain. We don't have to stuff it down. We don't have to make sure everything is okay because everything is not okay. 
there's a tremendous amount of suffering in the world right now. There's people probably taking their last breath, you know, under rubble in Turkey, if they're even still alive. You know, it's staggering in Syria. It's staggering the amount of loss of the loss of life over there. And they're living under a dictator who's not helping the situation, who made it exponentially worse, who views NGOs and, you know, a lot of charity organizations as terrorists and didn't let them into the country. You know, they have a few in their helping, but it's certainly not what it would be in, in a democratic society, the rescue effort. And people are dying because of that. You know, and, and they'd already suffered hurricanes, I mean, hurricanes, earthquakes back in the day, you know, not long ago where they had a tremendous loss of life and and they were supposed to rebuild new buildings that were going to have some sort of safety code like we have in California. And that didn't happen, even though the people pay an earthquake tax and have been for like a decade. All that money basically disappeared, was divided up by Erdogan's cronies, and they built cheap construction they had a 7.5 earthquake, you know, a week ago, and all those new buildings came down with people inside them, and now they're suffering. That's a result of politics, right? You can't stop the earthquakes, but you can stop corrupt politicians that add to the suffering, and that's sad, right? That's a very tragic thing, but you have to be able to feel the sadness and have a clear enough mind to understand, like, why is this worse than it should be, right? And who's doing that? And who's allowing these people to do that? And how do we stop that? But just the suffering alone is staggering. Look at Ukraine, you know? Look at the Russian troops that are going in there now are these prisoners, you know? Poor guys in Russia that got sent to prison for selling weed you know, and meth and stuff. There's a great article in the New York Times the other day about one of them. And, you know, they, they would reduce their sentences. So guys are doing, you know, 10 year sentences. They're like, well, we'll, we'll knock the rest of the eight years off your sentence if you go join the front lines. And it was the Wagner group, which is their private military arm that was doing this, right? It was making these offers. And then they'd send the guys, you know, down to Ukraine and or to the front and they wouldn't get any training. They would just send them out to walk towards the trenches that were occupied by Ukrainians and Ukrainians would mow them down. And then the next five guys would go up there and get mowed down. And the Russians were using it to get intelligence on where they were dug in and where they had the weapons. They knew that they were gonna kill the guys and you know they didn't care. That's a, such a lack of disregard for human life. And why is it happening like that? Because of a dictator, because of Putin, right? So now you got two dictators, Erdogan and Putin right? Not to mention Hungary and Italy now and all these other places that are skewing right. The politics of that always transfers to human suffering. And, and the fact that it's being adopted in this country is terrifying, right? That's their model. CPAC, you know, had Orban come and speak here. Ron DeSantis is fastening himself on being like a little mini Putin down in Florida, all the messaging from the GOP is, is designed to incite hatred, to, to, to fear the other, to hate them, as I talk about every week. And they all capitalize on it. Nikki Haley just announced she's going to run for president this morning. Did you see her video? I mean, it looks like Lenny Riffenstahl made it. You know, It's like, I'm not black or white, I'm the other like insinuating that black people had it easy in South Carolina. The only reason her family could emigrate there and do okay was because of the suffering of generations of African-Americans that fought battles that she had no part of, that she's now exploiting to promote an authoritarian form of government, which the GOP is now, 100%. They're fascists, right? This isn't your grandpappy's Republican Party. This isn't even Reagan era. You know, you can kind of forgive people for buying the BS. You know, this is like a, a thing we haven't seen before. And it's deadly and it's dangerous and it causes suffering. And if you can't connect to your humanity, you're not going to be able to change it as effectively. That's what love is about, right? Forget the Valentine's Day, you know, giving a box of chocolates. How about loving yourself? How about for Valentine's Day, we bring real love into this world? 
and address all this suffering. You know, that's what we need to do. There was a 15 year old girl who was murdered in the UK over the weekend by two other 15 year olds. She might've been 16. She was a transgender girl. And she was murdered. And I could barely talk yesterday. I was so pissed off and sad. And I still am. Right? And I saw videos of this girl getting bullied earlier in her life where she died. And I saw a picture of her sitting in a park eating a chocolate bar with a soda and a beautiful smile on her face. You know, a beautiful child. who probably already endured so much, who had endured bull bullying. I've seen the videos of her fighting before this moment. And I can't imagine what her last moments were like, being attacked for who she was, you know, just wanting to live life. Her parents just wanting her to live life and be happy. That's a crime against humanity, you know? And you have grown adults J.K. Rowling, whoever the hell this, I never watched a Harry Potter movie or read one of the books, you know? But like, what an asshole that lady is. What a fucking asshole, you know? Ricky Gervais, who's a funny alcoholic, as alcoholics are sometimes, you know? But these guys who make cheap jokes, the comedian that everybody, David Chappelle, you know? Like, you can't get some more material, dude. You can't lay off people who are getting attacked. You know, because it makes it all right for the truly evil parties like the Republicans to now make that their policy. And in Missouri right now, as I'm taping this, there's people outside, you know, the Senate chamber in the state house trying to fight for trans children's rights while the, you know, fascist Republican men try to legislate hate. And they've done it in South Dakota. They're doing it in all these red states. They're doing it in Florida. They're attacking children. What does a trans child or adult have anything to do with your life? Why does it threaten you? Love is love. You know, I, I my mom is a lesbian in a lesbian relationship. I one they have they've had, you know, transgender roommates when I was a kid. I hung out with all these people. Like, there's nothing wrong with being gay, non-binary, queer, lesbian, gay. It's all love, man. Relationships are relationships. It doesn't matter who you love. It matters that you love. And, and it's being sold to people that it's okay not to love somebody else because we're telling you that that person is bad. you know. And it's a sickness. It's a cancer in this world that is corrupting other children to not only bully, but now murder their peers because they think they can get away with it. To me, that that disgusts me to the point that I want to give up, you know, not give up on life, but like, how, how, do you, how do you make sense of such a mad world? You know, love, empathy, awareness, self-care, knowing when to stop. Like, I got to step away. This is just too much right now. You know, I was trying to process that step away from it. And then I heard about a shooting, as we all heard about in Michigan State, when I was trying to be like, stay off Twitter, no, don't do this. You know, just go watch Netflix or something. Then there's a shooting, which is like, we've had hundreds of mass shootings already this year, and it's only Valentine's Day. The year is only six weeks old. And we have dozens of shootings already, Americans who've lost their lives. There were children running out of their dormitories last night who had been in shootings in Michigan. Who There was a girl in Sandy Hook who survived Sandy Hook who was, had to run out of the building last night, who still has injuries from Sandy Hook from having to cower in a classroom. How are we doing this? I live 20 minutes from Sandy Hook. You know, it, it, it's mind boggling to me, the evil that's happening in this world. And it's not just happening out of like a vacuum and nobody knows why. There was congressmen handing out pins last week on the floor of the house and the idiots were wearing them, the little AR-15 pins, you know, that George Santos and the Nazi chick 
Anna, whatever, they came out that she's lying about everything. And her grandfather was a Nazi. She says she's Latin. She said she was Jewish before that. She grew up in California, you know, like middle class. She lied about all this stuff, her dad going to prison, like her own family's like, none of that happened, you know, but she created an image that would work in Florida. And now she's a gun-toting Latino Republican right? Wearing an AR-15 pin. Those pins were handed out by a congressman who has a $25 million stake in a firearms manufacturer that sells assault rifles, right? And they're wearing them on the floor of the Congress because it's a big F you to the lips, right? This is just last week, and now we have a shooting. And they go silent whenever there's a shooting, and they'll wait a couple days, and then they'll be back in your face, it's Valentine's Day. The Parkland shooting was five years ago today. Marjorie Stoneman High School. I was on a Zoom call with Fred Gutenberg last week. He's part of this Democratic group that I, you know, that I get to be part of. You know, seeing that guy sitting there in his office at home with a big picture of Jamie, his beautiful daughter behind him, seeing the pain in his eyes man in his voice knowing that this guy is never ever going to be the same you know he's going to continue to fight and he's a wonderful advocate but you know uh, it, it, it's mind-boggling that other human beings would want to force that on anybody even if you never knew him you would think that is so beyond the pale i don't want any other adult to have to lose their children when they're sending them to school and it's happening on a regular basis in this country you know, Sandy Hook was just repeated in Uvalde this past year. You know, we're, we're, we're telling our children they're expendable because the gun lobby is too profitable and they own too many politicians. All of our American holidays are being marred by mass shootings. We had a shooting at a parade the 4th of July this year. There was a two-year-old wandering around with blood on his face. Some strangers found him, brought him back to his grandparents. They brought him home and had to tell him he wasn't ever going to see mommy and daddy again because they were killed in a mass shooting on the 4th of July. Is that America? Is that the country you want to live in? Because that's the country we are now. You know, I'm not trying to rant to you guys. I just get pissed about this because somehow we're acting like we don't have the power to change it. And we do. But it's incumbent upon all of us to make a difference. The kind of people I know that sort of vote Republican and support this stuff, they go silent when there's a mass shooting. They're not on Facebook talking about it. Every time their kid has a ball game, they got 50 pictures and 50 comments about how great their kid was at the swim meet or whatever the hell it was, right? But every time there's a mass shooting, they just go silent. They don't do politics. It's sort of impolite to speak about it publicly, but then they show up at the ballot boxes and they respond to the fear and lies and bigotry that's pumped into their minds by Rupert Murdoch and the Republican Party. And they pull that lever knowing somebody else's kid and maybe their own won't come home someday because they're scared of liberalism. They're scared of immigration. Half the shit they have is because of democratic policies. Most of the middle class and the part of the country I live is a, a result of the New Deal and the GI Bill. That's what built the middle class in this part of the country. Okay. Before that, you had Vanderbilts and Rockefellers, you know, and Roosevelt's. And Roosevelt was one of those guys. But even he realized this shit ain't right, you know, and we rebuilt America. Those are socialist policies. Democratic socialism was at its peak under Eisenhower. You know, Eisenhower wasn't woke. That's Ike. <laughs> you know, he was one of the great generals in World War II, but he came home and he taxed the wealthiest Americans at 70% and it built a middle class. You could put two kids through college, have two cars in a garage and a wife home working. Maybe that wife shouldn't have been home working. She should have had a shot at a career. But the point is you could raise the American nuclear family buy a house, buy into the American dream, do this as a result of democratic socialism. Then Reagan came along and said, no, that's not fair. Why should a CEO only make 20 times as much as his employees? He should make 200 times as much, right? So the whole thing got flipped on its head and we had 
trickle down economics. And now your CEO makes 20,000 times as much as, as his lowest employee. And most of his employees are in some other part of the world right now getting exploited, you know, and all those towns that had those factories in them turned into rust belts, right? That's republicanism. That's trickle down economics. And thankfully, that's what Biden's trying to build back. He's reinvesting in this stuff. And they're training these people to hate him. At the same time, they're benefiting from his policies. You know, when I was doing that messaging stuff at the White House, I drove around Pennsylvania for a week and I'd see all these construction sites, you know, new construction, Lettuce, Pennsylvania, Allentown, all these places. There was buildings going up, new hotels, all this kind of stuff. And these dudes that were showing up on these job sites would have brand new pickup trucks, you know, a paycheck. They were obviously doing well, right? We're coming out of the, you know, down tick 2000 kind of, you know, 2020 rather, you know, the shutdown economy, it was booming, right? It's it, People are getting back to work and stuff. And what did these guys have on their cars? You know, come and take it like in a picture of an AR-15, right? You know, let's go Brandon stickers because they're trained to hate Biden, the guy who's feeding them. You know, they're biting the hand that's feeding them because these Republican politicians will come in and lie and take credit for things that were part of the Infrastructure Act or the American Recovery Act and claim it as their own, even though they voted against it because they have this cultural wedge issue of firearms. And they know if they appeal to the toxic masculinity you know, of a people that are very emasculated, right? A lot of these dudes in America were sold a kind of bullshit ideology about who they were. It was all John Wayne and Clint Eastwood and all this Rambo bullshit that my generation grew up with. Guys, don't cry. Don't be a, you know, don't, what are you, gay? You know, that's what everybody said when I was a kid. What are you, gay? What if I am? <laughs> you know what I mean? What's it to you? What's wrong with it, right? The homophobia, the toxic bullshit. And, and, and a lot of that stuff is, is, you know, the church promotes a lot of that crap, especially whatever version of the church we have now with this, you know, Jesus gets us. That's the Hobby Lobby. That's a billionaire who's about as anti-gay rights as you could get, anti-abortion as you could get. He's got, you know, he's got you know, Sam Alito in his back pocket. There's that whole case in SCOTUS, you know, where they leaked a decision where, where, where Alito was bragging about it at a dinner party. These guys own judges, Supreme Court judges, you know, foisting this bigotry on America. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. So get in touch with your sadness, right? Th that's the best way to find what your love is. You know, find what makes you cry and then you might find what has value to you in life. Instead of stuffing it down, instead of pretending like you don't feel anything, put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Put yourself in those parents' position in Michigan right now that probably got a phone call last night, you know, that their daughter or son, who they were scraping money together to send off to college, a great school. You know, Michigan State's one of the first land-grant universities. College used to just be for rich folks before schools like Michigan State. And it opened it up to the middle class, you know, and working class people. You could go and affordably get an education. It used to be if you weren't, you know, if you weren't born into the right family, you weren't going to be a doctor or a lawyer, right? How many people entered our professional class and made a difference in this country because of schools like Michigan State? You know, how many? Stuff like that betters who we are as a people. It makes us stronger as a country. You're going to let it get shot up. You're going to let the children get shot up. Put yourself in those parents' position. Think about what that feels like. You know, there's a lot of kids at that school, right? Say there's 20, 25,000 kids. That's 20, 20, you know, that's 50,000 parents sitting there praying the phone didn't ring last night or, or the knock didn't come at the door for what for nothing so people can have handguns freely you know it ain't worth it we're giving too much so a few 
idiots can keep their guns. You know, if you're cool and you got a gun, go fucking hide it in your attic, put it in your closet. You know, nobody's really going to come in your house and take the guns that are already there. There's over 400 million guns in this country. No way anybody's collecting them all. But let's stop selling new ones and let's make it very hard to get them. And let's certainly not let people get assault rifles and ammunition online and all this other stuff. It's insanity. It's insanity. I, you know, I was going to talk about, I was going to talk about the Saudi Arabia like article that you know Trump and Kushner, which was amazing in the Washington Post Sunday. I, I don't want to do that to you <laughs> after just giving you this rap, you know. Let's let's talk about love, you know. Let's talk about compassion and education. I, I mentioned CSN did this, you know, this this tribute kind of. They were being honored by the jazz at Lincoln Center, so it was Wynton Marsalis was leading the band, and Stephen and Graham and David. You know, we we got to rehearse for a week. I had to, I got to be in the room because I would take care of them, and I ran a teleprompter for them and stuff, and it was amazing to watch. And they were all intimidated. Right. That, you know, Crosby, his music lends itself to jazz, but he doesn't know how to read music. He didn't know how to read music or anything. But Guinevere is like these far out weird chords. So jazz guys love that. Miles Davis covered Guinevere. And, and there's a funny story that Graham told me. I, I don't know if I've told it before, but this was like the late 60s. OK, maybe early 70 or something. And, and and Miles was working on Bitches Brew, like his first big fusion album. And he ran into Crosby in New York City in like Washington Square Park or something. And he's like, Cros, I'm recording Guinevere, man. I recorded it. It's great. Come over to the house and listen to it. You know, so he brings Crosby to his apartment. It's townhouse, right? Miles lived on the Upper West Side, I think in the 70s. And uh so he brings Crosby over and he's like, I'm going to put it on and, you know, smoke a joint and listen to it, you know, and, and Miles had some beautiful woman with him and Miles went in the bedroom, like while he put on the record and Crosby sat in the living room, smoked a joint and listened to this version, you know, that, that Miles Davis had of his song had done and uh, comes out and he's like, Cross, what'd you think? You know, and Cross is like, I hate it. Take my name off it. <laughs> That was Crosby and like walked out of the apartment. <laughs> and Graham told me like in the 80s, he ran into Miles at the Grammys and Miles goes, hey, is Cross still pissed off at me? <laughs> that's the, that's Cross, right? He, he, he would be arrogant to Miles Davis. You know, most people would be like, hey, you know, what an honor. Cross was like, eh, I don't like it. Take my name off it. That's Crosby. I'm not saying that to diss him. I'm just saying that's a little insight of what he was like and what a character. How many people on this planet would have the balls to tell the truth to Miles Davis about not liking their song, right? It also gives you tremendous like respect in the jazz world that, you know, Miles covered your song. So anyway, so so Crosby is the most likely guy, you know, to 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 have his music sort of mesh with the jazz at Lincoln Center. And on the first day, Winton was like, I, I know what to do with your song. Like, we'll just have you play it and I'll back you up and it'll be great, you know? But we had to work on all this other stuff with Stills and with Graham. And we were in a, so we did it all in this room. Elvis Costello came and just hung out and it's like Winton at a piano and they're doing this arrangement. And it was just amazing, like masterclass in music making. And uh, we go to do the rehearsal on the stage and this is like going to be the day of the show the night of the show or something and we do a couple run throughs and you know stills can't hear super well sometimes and he didn't like how the drummer was you know there wasn't enough of a shuffle in, in this song and it, it got a little tense and we did a couple run throughs and i'm running the teleprompter on the side of the stage and i can see that these guys are spent right like it's gonna work out anyway it's not like the jazz at lincoln center is gonna mess up like playing you know three chord, you know, harmony pop songs, right? So like, you know, it, it was more about like keeping the mood correct, the vibe correct, right? So we did a, a couple run throughs and, and I knew enough, I'd worked with the band long enough to know that they were ragged. Like, I was like, another run through is gonna kill these guys right now. Like this whole thing is like the wheels are gonna come off. And somehow, Miles didn't look at, I mean, Miles, <laughs> Winton didn't look at me but he somehow realized that vibe 
and he goes, hey, you know what? I got some great food. Why don't we take a break and have lunch now? You know, and he had all this great Cuban food they brought in. It was just delicious. And he's like, why don't we take a break? So then he got 25 band members in the orchestra and, and the band themselves. And everyone's relieved because nobody wants to be on the spot again and see it gets tense, see it gets get tense. And we had a great lunch and then just did a run through and went into the show. And it was phenomenal. And my point in that is like, there's love in that right? It, it, it's not about the mastery of the music. It's about the vibe and the nourishment of like, hey, these are just people up here. We're all just people with insecurities and pressures and doing our best. And sometimes we need self-care. We need to feed ourselves because that's what we're doing with the audience. We're trying to feed them something, right? We're trying to give them some nourishment, some music that'll help their souls and help them get through their day and their lives right? That's what it is. It's, it's an exchange, right? So when he says, you know, the first listener is the player, that's deep. And that's a guy who understands that fundamentally, right? Because he knew these players were going to get broken. And sometimes you just got to stop and have some chicken and rice, some black beans, you know, <laughs> like have a good lunch and celebrate life. Hey, we're alive. We're just making music. It's not that big a deal. And we did the gig and they they hooked all the guys up with Brooks Brothers suits because that sponsors, they sponsored jazz at Lincoln Center, first class organization. And at the end of the gig, it was for the big donors. It wasn't like the general public could get a ticket. You know, it was for the, the they raise all their money for, you know, the year off of these kind of events. So, you know, a couple thousand dollars a seat and there's a big party at the Rose Audit, you know, the Rose room whatever they call it for you guys that know lincoln center you know outside of the actual like theater you perform in there's this other ancillary lobby room that overlooks columbus circle and it has these big glass thing i mean it's a stunning stunning building and uh so there's a party afterwards with all these donors and everything and and, and we finish the concert and we're sort of making our way to the party and, and we're getting out of the dressing room and Winton comes up, he goes, let's do a second line. You guys want to do a second line? And they do a second line, like in, in New Orleans. And I was like, I'm getting in that second line. So me and Stills got in at the end. I think they gave us a tambourine or something. So all these jazz musicians with their horns made their way through this party, you know, with a thousand people at it. We kind of snaked through like a parade at Mardi Gras. And the spirit that you could feel coming off the music and coming into the people I'll remember for the rest of my life, you know, and, and, and I don't care if I'm like tearing up talking about it because Stills was so happy. I was so happy. The people were so happy. It was like being in a parade of love, you know, lifting spirits, you know, and, and nothing does that like jazz and the jubilation, you know, that comes in that music, even in moments of despair, right? There is no better funeral than, than the kind you'll see in, in New Orleans, right? Because because you reconnect with the spirit and you realize love doesn't leave us, right? But we have work to do while we're here. And the music and the arts help us do that work, you know? They reinforce our spirits. They, they give us moments of grace and moments of gratitude and sometimes moments of joy. And when we snake through that crowd and I was sitting there with those guys clapping and playing that tambourine, I was like, this is one of those moments. This is, you know, this is as good as it gets. And it's not about the ego. It's not about the money, right? It's not about the fame or the access. It's about being part of the parade that is bringing joy and making life better, you know? And we can all do that. We can all do that in so many ways every day especially on days like valentine's day because there's probably somebody in your life that's lonely right now that you could call up that isn't expecting it there's probably somebody who lost their loved one you know so do it you know bring love bring joy out there you know bring music because we need a big second line because this world is you know this world is going through a, a funeral right now you know we're losing a lot of people I lost somebody last week in my life, you know, who I've known my whole life. He was a great friend of my uncle's guy named Lansing Moore, incredible guy, you know, went to Brown with my uncle. I've known him since then, since 1980 or something, 
He was a groomsman at my uncle's wedding, had a great career, you know, ran a, an art studio in Manhattan that restored like incredible works of art, did, did work in John Lennon's apartment on his paintings, gourmet, you know, just a gourmand, like a, a guy who was like one of those first like real intellectuals I met like a guy who really understood what the good stuff was in life and you learn from him why this is like the best balsamic, you know, or wine or food. Guy lived his life to the fullest, but he he died young and he leaves behind a wife and his family, he's 64. Heartbreaking, you know, and everybody's got a story like that these days in the last couple of years. If you don't, you're lucky. But, uh, you know, my point is there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of sadness and and there's a lot of beauty. And there's a lot of joy. And even when we're at our low points and sad, we got to cling to that. You know, we got to hold on to hope. You know, let me pick up this guitar. We got to hold on to hope, you know. We'll do our own second line. I'll play. But anyway, that was the episode. That's episode 64 of the uh, Noel Kassler podcast here. We don't need the drums. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. I appreciate you. I'll be back next week, I promise. Take care of yourselves. Peace. <laughs>